This week, we welcome guest commentator and contributor today for Enterprise Security Weekly, none other than Ron Gula, no stranger to the shows here on Security Weekly. Uh, we'll be talking about attack simulation, uh, threat detection, SIM. We're going to cover news this week, including uh, headlines from ServiceNow, uh, Red Hat, Psychotic, Extra Hop, Garukul, and more. So stay tuned for this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm a tiger. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly. I don't know how this is going to go because Paul's not here this week, but we're just going to give it a shot. If Even if you've got experience in security, you you can benefit from going to somewhere where, and learning about that bug again. Wearing my tactical turtleneck just for Mr. John Strand, who is on the lines via Skype. John, welcome to the program. I'm wearing the uh, tactical fleece as well, Paul. This is Excellent. a fully, completely, and utterly tactical show. Improve the efficiency and effectiveness of your security operations with DF Lab Security Orchestration, Automation, and Response Technology. Automate threat containment, orchestrate incident response, and measure operational performance with DF Lab's Inc. Mansour platform. Leverage your current security resources to minimize incident resolution time, maximize analyst efficiency, increase the number of incidents handled, and reduce overall risk. Inc. Mansour acts as a force multiplier, enabling your security team to do more with less. Streamline the full incident response life cycle automation process today. Keep your cybersecurity incidents under control with DF Labs. Visit dflabs.com forward slash security weekly and request to see Inc. Mansour live in action. Are you an enterprise dissatisfied with overpriced analytics software that can't keep up with modern data? If so, then GraphWell is the solution for you. GraphWell is an unstructured data analytics platform for enterprises who demand total data visibility across their network. GraphWell lets your security team go beyond the SIM and fuse data sources to correlate and answer questions you didn't know needed to be asked. Go to gravwell.io forward slash security weekly for an unlimited data trial and gain uncompromising visibility today. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Welcome, everyone, to uh, this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, for Wednesday, May 16th, 2018, broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios. A quick announcement, if you want to learn more about the state of endpoint security from experts here at Security Weekly, in addition to three sponsors that participated in this webcast, which include Endgame, Minerva Labs, and Rapid7, and get everyone's take on the endpoint security market, help you wade the waters on how you evaluate solutions in endpoint security, visit securityweekly.com forward slash on demand and go check that out. I am very pleased to welcome my very special guest for today, none other than Ron Gula. Ron, welcome to the show. I, I thought I was your very special friend and not just a very special guest. Well, today you're a friend and a guest. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> you have two hats on uh, today. Ron's actually worn many hats over the years, uh, from network security wizards to tenable network security, uh, to his role today in Gula Tech Adventures, which I'll say right now from every single time, Adventures, because it's an adventure, Ron. It is an adventure, and I predict probably within a year or two, you're going to see somebody else do the same thing and do adventures, and that's great. We want to have more adventures in cybersecurity. You're a trendsetter, Ron, for sure. <laughs> you're a trendsetter. Uh, so, Ron, just for those tuning into Enterprise Security Weekly, um, what, what are you doing today at Gula Tech Adventures? 
Oh, uh, wow. Today, um, so we this is our second year of, of uh, being in operation, and uh, we've invested in about 25 different cybersecurity companies, everything from pre-revenue, pre-customer, all the way to brands that you might know and recognize like Threat Connect or Flashpoint, uh, which are doing, you know, Series B, Series C type, type work. And uh, I used to think when I was running Tenable that I kind of had a view of the market. And now working with these startups and, and these other companies, I'm really learning that there's a lot more going on in cyber than I ever knew. You know, Ron, uh, yourself and Matt Alderman were, were huge inspirations to actually create this show because when I worked at Tenable, you both had such an awesome understanding of the market and I learned so much. So much so that after I left, we created this show. <laughs> so it's awesome. <laughs> and that's the spirit of success, right? People that's right. who are successful should be helping other people to be successful and that's part of the adventure. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the missions of this show, Ron, is to help people who are working for enterprises be successful in their jobs and choose security solutions that actually solve problems. And, you know, Michael Santarcangelo and Matt, you know, opened me up to uh, this whole creation of categories and play bigger uh, and help me understand how categories are created and uh, how they work and then applying that to security. So today I wanted to talk about a couple of different categories and kind of dig into uh, you know, who some of the players are, what problems they solve, and why you may or may not be considering this kind of solution. The first one I want to talk about is, I think, a category I'm probably most excited about today, as it's a newer emerging category, uh, is attack simulation. So, Ron, if you want to start us off and just, you know, talk about that category, what is it, uh, and what are some of the players, and, and what are the benefits? Yeah, so attack simulation, automated breach uh, simulation, they are a new category. Uh, companies in that space, Veridan, Attack IQ, uh, uh, Threat Care, which is one that we invested in. Marcus Carey, I think you've had him on, on the show before. Um, but there's a whole bunch. And, and simulating an attack is a lot like doing a penetration test. If you do a penetration test, you get a lot of benefit from that. And we, you know, we've talked on the show before about you, know, you can detect the pen test. Uh, you know, if you do a pen test and, and they find something, they, they don't find something, you know, what does that mean to your overall posture? But there's all these other benefits from a penetration test, such as, you know, uh, being able to use it to justify whatever you want to do. Maybe it's buy a vendor. Maybe it's change a policy. Maybe it's hire the third, you know, person in, in, in your SOC. Uh, but penetration tests are slow. Typically, you got to bring somebody in, somebody like John Strand. You got you to get on their calendar. Um, automated breach simulation basically has all the benefits of a manual penetration test or an actual incident without having to go through that. Literally, you can walk into a network and say, ah, today I want to exfiltrate you know, credit cards over a DNS TCP session, or I just left uh, evil.pdf on a certain file. Or you can actually simulate very advanced sort of nation state kind of implants that markets all over the place. I, I really think it's a big deal. People should be tracking it. Yeah. And so like, what are the goals? And I've heard it described a couple of different ways. Like you want to understand some of the gaps, but I think when I first learned about it, it was all about is my security architecture or are my security solutions actually working? And I think that's one part of a penetration test, right? Um, but this really kind of, I think, focuses in on understanding the shortcomings of your solutions. Is that true? It is. And the way I explain it is, is if you look at it from a Tenable point of view, all right, so Tenable has snippers, we grab logs, we have agents, we can connect to your cloud, uh, we can do uh, a scanning with credentials, without credentials. We take all that data back, and then we can tell you everything from, are you compliant with PCI? You know, are you deficient in certain areas of the NIST cybersecurity framework? You know, is your patch rate low? It's a very exact computational exercise. Mm -hmm. And although I think Tenable's, you know, the leader in that space, you know, a lot of customers don't implement 100% of that. Maybe we'll see them do credential scanning on the Windows network and maybe manual audits of the, the, the routers or, you know, something like that. It's not 100%. And you never actually see somebody doing things like, well, you know, I did the config audit of the Cisco switch and the span port's down, so my IDS is blind, right? That's just the kind of thing you don't see people doing with, uh, with, with a tenable solution, even though we had that kind of stuff built in. So when it comes to automated breach simulation, you know, you're doing it faster than a manual pen test, but you're not doing it sort of continuously like you would maybe with, you know, continuous agent, you know, vulnerability scanning. But the idea is you can guide the test. Um, so maybe you're uh, in the middle of a deployment of Tanium, for example, or CrowdStrike, pick your, pick your endpoint, 
and you know you're only halfway done, yet somebody in IT or IT security is saying, oh, no, we're covered, we're good, we're fully deployed. Great. Let me deploy a couple, you know, evil.pdfs out there or some some spurious, uh, you know, registry settings, whatever you want to do, and then prove that your your stuff is working or not. And that's a lot easier to do to see if you've got sort of buy in and things are working than a full on pen test. Mm -hmm. And and that's where this stuff is really, really powerful. How does vulnerability management and attack simulation work together? Like what's the, the relationship and your recommendation for organizations that are looking to implement both? So in a, in a mature organization, you've got vulnerability management and sitting right next to compliance, sitting right next to situational awareness. And literally the motion of measuring patches is the same motion as are all my crowd strikes deployed in my, my computers. In, in less mature organizations, though, they're different things. And the people who do vuln management literally count vulnerabilities. They, they're not doing you know, asset enumeration, situational awareness. They're not talking to the incident responders. They're not, they're not integrated. So uh, automated breach simulation is a great way to get all of those players at, at the table. Uh, I spoke at the Interop uh, ITX conference, and they, they do a nice little breakout session where they get uh, CISOs and, and people, and they were actually talking, how can we get our SOC talking to our compliance people? How can we get our compliance people talk to our, our IT people? And, you know, vulnerability scanning and management and cyber hygiene is, is good once you're mature, but when you're young, and you don't have that maturity, something like a pen test or automated breach simulation can bring everybody to, to, to the table together and demonstrate that there's deficiencies out there. I think it can also help with the priority as well, perhaps. It, it, it can be, you know, since it's uh, the, the humans are choosing the test, you know, hey, we're going to do a nation state implant. We're just going to do a simple uh, exfiltration. We're going to do a simple, um, you know, maybe it's a jailbroken iPhone, you know, whatever the test is. You know, it's not like you're doing all of them at the same time. You're picking them that are going to be politically salient and relevant to, um, you know, whoever's in charge of, of, of trying to get things out there. I, I, I look at it as a way if you have um, perhaps a chief security officer or head of IT, and it's a way to show that you've got a problem and a deficiency without making people look too bad. Uh, and it's also a great way of enhancing what you have out there because you'll you'll get into IT and and you'll you know, IT security and you'll get people who they just believe that they see they've seen every event they have all the forensics they don't need anything else and these tools can really show that there's deficiencies on the, on the network. In terms of the the features and solutions, what uh, of all the different vendors, what are some of the like major differentiators in the approach to to attack simulation? Yeah, it's it's uh, it's interesting. So I I look in terms of uh, technology simulation, and and this is not a good or, or 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 bad things. One of the reasons we invested in in threat care was because the technology was so easy to deploy. Mm. Uh, literally, you just basically add some JavaScript to a website everybody goes to, maybe your Office three sixty five homepage, maybe a company's homepage, and you can literally start doing port scans, schedule, you know, lateral movement tests, um, you know, with no software, nothing to deploy. Um, on the other end, you know, when you start looking at uh, like the Veridins and the attack IQ, you're really talking about implants. You're talking about, you know, the ability to, to try to simulate uh, a, a, a network, trying to test enclave connectivity. There's a lot more involved with that. But if you've got, you know, a, a sophisticated organization, you might want to uh, look at that. And uh, Safe Breach just took on a Series B. Is that yeah? Is that Safe true? Breach. There's a lot of people that have been doing uh, raising here, and I'm 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 very happy with with. That. I think the market's maturing. Yeah, and I, I I imagine you look at it the way we do, right? When we see a new emerging market like this, and if you're the only player in that in that space, it's kind of like, is it really a space? But if there's other competitors, and those other competitors are getting funding, I think that's good for the space, right? Competition is is a good thing. I, I tend to agree, and timing is everything. Mm. Uh, it would be nice to see um, you know, NIST Cybersecurity Framework, PCI, um, start talking about this form of, uh, of testing as a way to measure those deficiencies. Uh, but, uh, but right now, I'm just happy that there's been some investing and uh, people are realizing that there's some, some benefits. Now, when you run these simulations, you may find that they've done something that you can't detect. And in my analysis of the market today, there's got to be a hundred vendors that I put in a large category, right? Of, hey, we can you know look at some of your network traffic or maybe NetFlow. We can look at some of your logs. Uh, you know, maybe we're looking at DNS and DHCP. 
Maybe we're looking at some stuff from your SIM and we're taking that into our system. We're using machine learning. We're analyzing those results and we're telling you that you've got these indicators of compromise. That seems to be all the rage today and there's like a hundred different vendors. How do we navigate that, this space and what kind of subcategories are, are being created? Yeah, so the, the technology, automated breach you know, simulation, attack simulation, you can do so many things with it. And, and, and keep in mind, it's not a substitute for a penetration test or responding to an actual incident. But the fact that you can control these simulations, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Um, if you remember uh, when MassScan first came out, you know, mm -hmm. Rob Brand was scanning the internet. I wrote a, I wrote a blog at Tenel. said, look, if you're collecting all your telemetry, here's his IP address. Go look. If you don't have them in your, your your system, something is wrong, right? Your collection is wrong. Your sniffing is wrong. Right. You're throwing away some data incorrectly. And those are the kind of errors that, you know, you don't find maybe until an incident happens and you go, holy crap, we missed VLAN 32 for, 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 for some reason like that. Um, on the other hand, why are you doing the test? If you're doing the test and it's a third party managing your network, perhaps you have an MSSP, mm -hmm. perhaps you have outsourced IT, you might have a lot of different rules for how often you can and cannot, uh, you know, audit that that network. Every every corporation I talk to has different uh, rules of engagement for, you know, what you can do without creating too much workload on 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 that part. And then lastly, you know, maybe you just want to actually verify that your investments are working. Maybe you just spent five million dollars on on Splunk, or you know, you have a CrowdStrike deployment rollout. You just want to prove that it works and. You don't want to prove that it works with a dashboard. You actually want to say, look, I just, you know, spend money to have a simulated piece of, you know, advanced evasive malware or, you know, fireless memory, you know, whatever, whatever the attack of the week is. And uh, a lot of these vendors will do simulations for, for malware that's out there. And you can say, look, we ran it. It was detected. We, we think that's good. So there's a lot of different solutions for this or situations for it. What's your recommendation for those that are kind of frustrated with sim? and want something that's going to install some monitoring points, those could even be endpoints, and roll that up into a dashboard and say, to your SOC analyst, this is what's important. So that's, oh, yeah, uh, I'll tweet that out. And and because that's, we've solved that in the industry. That's the <laughs> problem, right? We haven't solved that. Right. And um, there's a hundred different vendors uh, that are doing snipping, logging, agents, um, bringing it back to the SOC, doing some sort of triage, throwing AI, machine learning, you know, threat correlation with it. And if you thought that that was working, then why are we still getting attacked? I mean, there's so many people who are getting popped left and right. Mm -hmm. They don't seem like, like we tend to view this as um, vendor overload. There's a lot of people duplicating these kind of, of uh, solutions out there. But, you know, what's kind of happening in the world world is it's, it's, it's hard to see. Um, so it all comes down to, I think, the NIST cybersecurity framework. You know, do you know what's on your network? Do you have the ability to, to, you know, protect those things? And then can you actually detect an intrusion? The problem with that is that those, those two things, before you even get into recover and res respond and recover, um, those are basically infinitely dense processes where you're not going to be able to, to, to guarantee 100% that you're detecting those things. Um, so along those lines, I like things like the honeypot technology. Mm -hmm. I like things like where you can share that that um, the telemetry from you, all of your um, other potential competitors, or that you have the FSI SACs, you have different banks who work together to share telemetry. I think that stuff's really good um, because what is bad is very very subjective, and and the SOC operators are are overloaded. I find it interesting, Ron, that you say the honeypot technology is interesting. I don't know if you've always had that particular viewpoint. Yeah, I've had a, uh, I, I've had sort of a, um, I, I'm lightening up on it. I used to believe that if you were deploying a honeypot, you were actually adding to your attack surface. Mm -hmm. Now I really believe that the attacks, the, the, the advantage to the offensive side is so high that, you know, it does make a lot of sense to, you know, rename your payment card industry uh, network one thing and then add up maybe two or three other fake networks that are called, you know, payment processing, you know, third party payment processing, that, that, that kind of thing. Uh, that really makes it difficult for somebody to, uh, uh, to, to get in there. Now, keep in mind, if you have nation states coming after you, they're going to get into your network. They're going to dwell for a month, to two months. And, you know, the more you can make it harder for them to dwell, you know, if you're hunting for them, you're going to be able to, 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 to see these types of things. There's still false positives. There's still, 
you know, things to tune there, but the, the, that, that market has, has matured quite a bit. So it, it sounds like that regardless of what type of monitoring system you have in place to detect these indicators of compromise, that there's great value in having some type of deception or honeypot in there as an additional indicator in addition to threat intelligence to help qualify that data. Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, you know, in the grand scheme of things, would you rather have twice as much monitoring, twice as much more vis visibility? Um, or do you want to put some of these, uh, you know, honeypots on your network? I, I think most people are going to want to use, use visibility. It's a, a, a thing that I hear over and over again. But having said that, the honeypot with the ability to do deception, deception documents, deception accounts. Um, yeah, I think you, 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 you have uh, Javelin as a sponsor. That's you know, a way to put deception, you know, into your domains. Um, you know, that is a good thing if you can merge it into your IT processes and not, overload your IT people with, you know, extra work, false positives, potential targets. And, and I think that's a, uh, that, that's a big deal. Now, having said that, I would much rather have, you know, virtual desktops. Um, you know, when I'm done with my workstation, it gets blown up mm -hmm. and, and, um, you know, I don't have to worry about, you know, putting agents on it or anything like that because everything's logged from the back end. And I have a storage area network with really positive access control and who sees this data. Um, anything we can do to minimize complexity is a good thing. Most organizations aren't ready to blow up their network and, and um, you know, really design it from a secure point of view, though. Right. And, and you know, operationalizing this environment, uh, what are your thoughts on security orchestration and automation? So, you know, when, when you look at network IDS and antivirus and firewalls, then we got we kind of got SIM. And SIM was supposed to be the end all of, of, of all the events. You're supposed to be able to do alerting and prioritization and, and, and that. But, but SIM really got assumed with compliance, mm -hmm. looking for logins, who, which, which admins had access to these systems. And it was so bad. Well, it, it, it worked, but it was, so, it, was, it was not useful for a large number of events, especially when you started bringing in network forensic solutions and, and endpoint solutions. There was too much. So that kind of... Um, you know, basically born the orchestration market. And I really, I, I literally blame FireEye and, and Carbon Black, right? Because people had FireEye on the end of the network and, and it would fire up an event and nobody put it in blocking mode because that was too slow. So then we had to have this orchestration system to go talk to Carbon Black and see if any of the, 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 mm -hmm. the IOCs from the thing that we just detonated, you know, were, were on my computer. And that was sort of the birth of the orchestration system. Now, what I like about the orchestration system is you can really write down what security is. When, when people go and they uh, have a SOC and they talk about, oh, if this happens, these are the processes we want to run. Uh, if this happens, this is what we want you to automate. The thing I like about that is, is it's basically defining what security is for that, for that company. Uh, what I don't like about it is typically they completely ignore asset discovery, compliance events. Um, you know, nobody wants a PCI non-compliant event, you know, in the middle of the month, right? Or middle of the quarter. They want it at the end of the month. They don't want to do those kind of things, believe it or not, for a lot of different uh, different reasons. Now, that's starting to change a little bit. But for the most part, I think the orchestration market is going to get sort of all folded back in to whatever security framework you're buying into, whether it's a MSSP, whether it's a, a, a firewall and with agents whether it's uh, you're going all in with Splunk, um, whatever your sort of security religion and technology is, orchestration is going to be a big feature of that. Yeah. And, you know, that's one reason, uh, Ron, where I liked the acquisition by Rapid7 of Command. And because we've already kind of started to see now that uh, incorporation of the security orchestration automation into these other systems. And, and it, gets, it, it gets really personal after a while because... Um, I can show you an IT orchestration system for managing, I don't know, Kubernetes, you know, whatever DevOps type stuff. And I literally get pitches from these kind of companies and I go, okay, well, why can't I just write a bunch of rules for, you know, Splunk alerts with Palo Alto, you know, from this. And, and I, and I could, so it's all about just content and, 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 and sharing that. And I think it's a good thing. Uh, people still, no matter what though, they still run out of disk space. They still run out of processing power. Everything doesn't get hooked up. There's a lot of like behind the scenes minutia that, that doesn't happen that I think gives SOX the illusion that they have too many alerts and they're actually missing some things, which brings us back to the automated breach simulation. Right, right. Um, what I find interesting too, analyzing the market, Ron, is sometimes there'll be a new category that emerges and 
we see new companies being created in, in that category, trying to solve the problem. And then the category kind of falls apart, right? Like companies in their pivot and then they get acquired and it really just becomes a feature. And I think uh, user behavior analytics is certainly fallen into, into that category. What's your assessment of, uh, of that market? So uh, it's a feature. And uh, again, when we, when we look at how orchestration kind of came out of the, the, the sim market, mm. um, you know, people said, well, hey, let's just look at the users. Let's figure out where the, the, the users are. And that could have been, you know, my credentials. That could have been um, maybe, you know, the behavior of my, my devices changing. Um, and, 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 and what, like for Ron Gula, it means a little bit different for my account on Office 365 versus my iPhone versus my, you know, my, my, my corporate. But taking a user look at that, there's a lot of value in that, especially when you've got, you know, in, the, in a post Edward Snowden, you know, mm -hmm. reality winner world. Um, that's a very interesting view of, uh, of, of, of those things. Um, you know, one of the companies we invested in was, uh, was Red Owl and, and Red Owl actually went way beyond, um, what I consider, you know, uh, audit trail, you know, activity telemetry. It actually read your email and, and in the financial world, you're supposed to, you know, have your email audited and looked at. So you're not talking about certain topics with your clients and mm -hmm. certain topics with the media. And, and that's actually true user behavior analytics. I'm reading your email and figuring out what's going on. Now that concept is very alien to a lot of people, but when you look at the type of you know things that like the CIA is dealing with with their with their uh, leaks or other big banks with their with their leaks, the concept of hey, I'm going to read email as a form of user behavior analytics is is something alive and well with a lot of organizations. And you know we did a, a briefing yesterday actually with uh, with Racktop Systems, and in, uh, that certainly applies to their technology. Uh, and I had been you know exposed to their team. Uh, for the first time yesterday, and I was like, wow, so that's kind of like uh, user behavior analytics with some insider threat detection, but all focused around your data, which I think is cool. Yeah, and it's it's interesting. The um, You know, if you look at like firewall, so when Palo Alto came out, nobody, nobody said, hey, we need a new firewall, but they made it so much easier to do user-based application access control, and then Palo Alto did extremely well. And then the same thing happened with endpoints. People are like, endpoints are saturated. We don't need another 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 endpoint. And of course, Carbon Black is able to go public with mm -hmm. basically an endpoint uh, you know solution. So when I look at all these sort of next gen technologies, you know, companies like Racktop, where they really simplify network attack storage, they call it convergence, um, and you have all of this stuff integrated into where you're putting your data, accessing who has at it, make it really easy to audit. That's the kind of stuff that, you know, anytime you can reduce complexity, recruit, reduce cost and increase visibility, that's a phenomenal type of uh, solution. Awesome. Uh, any uh, closing thoughts uh, on the industry uh, today, Ron, before we uh, take a break and go on and talk about enterprise security news? Um, so I think the closing thought, uh, you know, we did RSA, went out there, had a, had a, had a great time. So we support a lot of our companies, but we saw a lot of, uh, of, of different companies out there. The big thing was integration and orchestration. Almost every company we talked to or was advertising was, hey, we integrate with, with, with other people. And my disappointment was not only was the integration there, but my, it was good, but the, the disappointment was, okay, what do I do with this data once, mm -hmm. I, once I bring it in? And in some cases, the integrations were really minor and probably customer driven for like one or two use cases. And in some cases, the integrations happened, but you know, what, what, what do you do with these things after that? So, so I think we have a longer way to go because we have so many product companies. Everybody can't integrate with everybody, um, but we are seeing a lot of trends like people integrating with ServiceNow and, um, you know, we've seen a lot of people integrating with Tenable, integrating with patching, integrating with, with, with the hunt thing. So I'm just pretty happy with that, but we still have a much longer way to go. Yeah, I, I completely agree on the integrations front. You know, the devil is always in the details is what I advise uh, clients that are like, oh, well, they have this integration. I'm like, but did you look into it? Like, does it actually solve your problem or not? Uh, which sometimes you have to get it in a lab to really, you know, understand exactly what it does. So awesome. With that, we're gonna take a short break, come back and talk about the enterprise security news for this week. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 